welcome everyone to this special episode of An Hour With, where I'm talking with Dr. Katie Sanderson, who works in the ICU unit of a North London hospital. She wanted to talk to me about the campaign that she started called Asks for Masks, a campaign that I'm very, very happy to be associated with. The auction, and we're raising money for PPE for frontline care workers. The auction is open now, and there's a live event on Thursday, the 14th of May, that's this coming Thursday, at 8.15 after the clap for carers. You can also follow us on the Asks for Masks YouTube channel. Uh, during this podcast, uh, Katie mentions an author. That author that she referenced was Hadiza Hawa Garba. Season two of the podcast will return with more episodes next month. Until then, stay safe and stay well, and lots of love. So, I'll start from the beginning, I guess. When when did you qualify as a as a doctor? Um, so I was late to the game. I qualified as doctor in um, 2017. So you say late to the game. How old How old were you? Oh, I don't know. Um, I'm 32 now, so I was 30, maybe. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd done something else before. What did you do before? Or could you not talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> if it's PR, I'm going to really, really laugh. <laughs> Um, I used to work for a publishing company, um, and before that, I did a history degree. And so, why? Because people think of medicine as this sort of vocation that you you have from birth. So, you, 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 the first sentence you're you're able to say as a child is, "I want to be a doctor." Um, did you have that and repress it, or did you just not have it a, in, until you were in your late twenties? I was quite sort of shy growing up and I think it takes some confidence to imagine yourself being a doctor and there were no sort of doctors in my family really didn't really know that many doctors and I think it, I don't know it's not something I really imagined myself doing um, but when I was at school I did sort of enjoy science and I did um, a very weird combination of A-levels so I did a Spanish and a history and an economics A-level and then I did a chemistry A-level which um, I did try quite hard to give up, but fortunately they wouldn't let me. And so um, I did it and that stood me in very good stead when I decided to go into medicine. But I think, I don't know, it took me a while to come to. And then I thought about it a bit more in my 20s. And I, I don't know, I suppose I've always been quite concerned with issues of social justice. I thought a bit about becoming a lawyer and doing things to do with legal aid. And um, then I ended up doing this and I'm very glad I have and I suppose be, being a doctor is the is you're on the front line of social justice. Obviously, you you know your your Hippocratic oath means that you treat everybody fairly and as promptly as possible and w- without prejudice, um, and and with urgency, um, which isn't um, always simpatico with the way that the government treats people. I suppose whatever government it may be. Yeah, I think that's true, and you know one of the it's a strange sort of intersection of different sectors, isn't it? Because one of the things that's frustrating about hospitals and medical care, I suppose, is, you know, it's the thing that's free at the point of entry and ideally there's sort of few barriers to accessing it, although obviously there are barriers. And I think one of the things that's difficult is things that end up in hospital are often things which probably should have been dealt with in other parts of society. So people with poor housing, people with inadequate care, people with drug dependence, um, people who drink too much, people who are overweight, you know, lots of these things, sort of, because I think we've underinvested a lot in public health and sort of other areas of life, fall to the NHS in ways that I don't think are a very brilliant allocation of resources, because acute hospitals are not designed to deal with those problems. And there's a poor integration of acute hospitals with a lot of the other sectors dealing with these problems and one of the things I think many of us feel very inadequate about and feel frustrated about about is these patients you see over and over again and they come in I saw a woman quite recently it's very very sad who's young has young children and who um, has really really severe liver disease from drinking and her drinking is sort of completely secret and she didn't admit to it at all for a long time and we Anyway, eventually it sort of emerged. Anyway, I saw her recently again, you know, I've seen her three times now and I can't help her with that. I I can help her every time she presents with, you know, terrible decompensated liver disease, but 
it's it's frustrating not you know I can't get to the root of sort of any of her problems and I think you know there are good alcohol services and there are less good alcohol services but it's you know sometimes you're the sort of end point in lots of processes that have gone wrong yes it, it it's it's I've made I've thought a lot about society during this time about how you know some of it almost certainly the social care angle needs to be sort of broken and restarted really with, with sort of a complete integration. Um, Because as you say, a lot of the people that you'll deal with in a clinical setting, people that could have been helped. So I mean, sometimes in some cases, decades earlier on, you know, if somebody has alcohol dependence, it may well have stemmed from something in childhood that made them scared or upset or troubled. And it takes, you know, an early intervention in terms of, therapy and, and 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 associated things to, to kind of steer them away by the time you see people I suppose the the mental health aspect so bedded in it's almost impossible to combat and it comes now with a sort of serious physical manifestation yeah and it can feel very it can feel make you feel quite hopeless as a doctor um and you know obviously I'm I work in a hospital and um in a hospice but you know, some it's very difficult for GPs who you know have limited resources to help with these things, and and you know I think it's could be organised better. It's yeah. I don't know what you see in your sort of homelessness, but you know many of these things start very young, and I think there's different rhetoric in different parts of society, but we seem to be happy to say with regards to sort of free healthcare at the point of access that, you know, that's a good thing and that we sh- should be advocating for the most vulnerable people in society. But I think, you know, the most vulnerable people in society seem to get um, a raw deal in lots of other areas. Well, way before they turn up at the hospital, way before yeah. they turn up at the, the, the GPs, I guess. And I think that is something you see in, in, all, in all sorts of situations in society, but whether they're people who are homeless or people who are um, acutely physically unwell, there's there's a whole chain of events that have pre- preceded that. Um, so you, I should, where exactly do you work? You don't have to say the name of the hospital, but in in which ward do you work? In which specialism? So I work in a hospital in North London, and um, I did my foundation training, which is the first two years, and then. For the last few months, what I've been, I've done a job which is split between a hospice um, and a sort of acute medical job. And then in the last couple of months, I've been working on a COVID ward because that was where the need was greatest. Um, so I've been working on a ward where we do CPAP, so sort of positive pressure ventilation um, for some patients, which is done in some hospitals in high dependence units and intensive cares and in other hospitals on sort of specialised wards. And then we have some patients who are on oxygen and who have COVID, um, but aren't as unwell. And it's it seems to me sort of your case is is very interesting because you're like a lot of sort of young recruits, new recruits who have had a very unusual fast tracking into emergency medicine in the sense that in, in, in a normal life, you, you would have perhaps been affiliated to the hospice, but you wouldn't have certainly been in a COVID ward and be dealing with people um, in extreme life or death situations. Is that is that fair, fair to say? Uh, I feel quite fortunate because I suppose I have a real interest in palliative care and I think that's probably what I'll end up doing. But the skills, so I worked in, I've worked in two hospices now, and those skills have been incredibly um, useful in the last few weeks, um, because, you know, we see many patients who, unfortunately, we're not able to do that much for, and actually making sure that they have the best death they can, and that it's dignified, and that it's peaceful, and it's comfortable, and working out what's important to them, and how you can sort of honour that is has been really important and I think there's a lot of focus on um in, there's been a huge focus on sort of intensive care and critical care capacity and that's actually relevant to relatively few people and although it's wonderful if we can save the lives of those sort of younger people often who um are critically ill you know the outcomes globally have not been brilliant you know in some 
by some sort of estimations, we think more than half of those patients will die. You know, actually looking after everybody else, looking after people who are ill in the community, who are at home, who are in care homes, and also people who wouldn't benefit from intensive care is, is an important thing to talk about and sort of prioritise as well. And it's something I feel very strongly about, particularly looking after people who actually, unfortunately, because we don't have good treatment for this disease, are going to die despite our best efforts. And um, that's something I suppose I feel quite, well, I feel really strongly about. How do you give a good death to somebody who is in isolation, somebody who can't feel the touch of their loved one on their arm or their hand or can't hear their voice? So I think it goes back for me almost to before that. So um, I think one of the main things, I've, I've had quite interesting conversations about this in the last few weeks. So very early on in this process, I looked after a patient whose family have said they're very happy for me to talk about her. Um, so a patient, it was when it was very, very chaotic and um, it became clear that we couldn't have any visitors in the hospital. And this woman had quite severe underlying health problems and um, it was very obvious that she wasn't going to survive. And it was the day that sort of more, you know, there was a lot of questions about whether people could visit the hospital or not and a lot of confusion. And um, we had a conversation, it was completely harrowing. We had a conversation with her family in a room with, on the phone with her on loudspeaker in a different room and we asked them all what what they wanted to do and sort of had you know I think I suppose the main thing is to say if you don't give people the opportunity to ask whether they're dying or tell them whether they're dying you can't have any of these conversations and I think sometimes as doctors and as medical professionals we're not very we're not very good at saying that to people and I see lots of people where it's clear they're going to die but actually we keep saying they're having treatment you know we're hopeful even though the outcome is you know pretty certain and anyway this lady decided and the family decided that um she actually wanted to go home and and she ended up she ended up going home and um, and there was a huge meltdown in sort of all the well I think across London all the hospital transport services and um, after a long delay they ended up taking home in the car knowing that she could potentially die in the car um, and she died in her bedroom with her family around and anyway her daughter's been in touch with me and um, has been incredibly generous and you know said that that's something that family would always remember and I was very fortunate because our local sort of palliative care support teams a nurse who had done a um, long shift on the day in question stayed in touch with this family all night giving them advice and some district nurses went to see her but you know there are lots of issues to do with um, PPE and district nurses who would traditionally go to people's houses and give medication if it's needed you know, it's been logistically very challenging I then had a conversation, um, I, wrote, I wrote something about it um, that was published and then I had a conversation with my aunt who said to me, I just want to tell you my view on this. And she said, my mother was told four days before she died by a really insensitive doctor that she was going to die. And it was really horrible. It made things much worse. It didn't serve any purpose. She was going to die anyway. And I feel really strongly that that was the wrong thing to do. And obviously, I don't, you know, it, I think the main thing is to have a relationship with patients so that you can start to have a conversation about what they want, what they want to know. And some people want to know more than others. And that's absolutely fine. And I'm not saying you should, you know, treat everybody in the same way. But I think you need to be able to start to have those conversations to work out what people want and that that's yeah. a sort of important skill for all doctors and healthcare professionals. And I suppose it takes a lot of time. And it's also much easier if you have continuity and you don't have a different person on a shift sort of every single day. I think at the moment we've never as a society probably been more aware of death in that there's this stark release every night of statistics. Yeah. Of course, those are only statistics that relate to the awfulness of COVID, but nonetheless they, they put into your mind, um, sometimes in a rather anxiety-inducing sort of low-level subconscious way, your your own fragile sort of existence. And I think it would be a very good time to for everybody to sort of think about that, you know, both in planning your own 
departure whenever that might be you know uh, but also for healthcare professionals I have to say you know having lost a parent and and many friends um, in the home setting it seems to be um, news that's incredibly well managed with a real degree of honesty and understanding uh, whereas in, I think in the hospital more sort of acute setting I think it can be much more traumatic because that is I, I remember a, a, a friend of mine who who had a, a, a horrific accident and was unconscious at the scene and um, I remember going to the hospital in, in Bristol and you know she was all hooked up to everything and had sort of heat pads and sensors and um, and I said, is she going to be, is she going to be able to come out of this coma? And the doctor said, oh, yeah, well, we're just working, we're working on it, working on it. You know, it's all, we're all working on it. And um, her boyfriend said, well, she's got a GS score of four, so that's good. And um, I uh, was leaving thinking, I don't know what that is. And a nurse actually came and said, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can for her. And I knew what she meant. And I went home and I looked up the GS score. The yeah. Glasgow GCS. 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 Sorry. GCS. Um, and there was absolutely no way she was ever going to come out of, of of that coma. And I think you sort of, I wasn't close family, I was a friend, but, I, you know, I, I felt... Why do you think it is that we find these conversations so, I don't know, hard to have? Because it's a, you know, it's a source of constant sort of amazement to me. Well, I don't. As I say, I think I think when when the when the news has been given, I've been I've been around some some friends who've and been around when they've received that news in in a, in, a, in a sort of home setting, and it's been dealt with extraordinarily because it's like, what decisions do you want to make? Do you want to be here? Do you want to go to a hospice? What do you want? But I think in, it must be very very hard for doctors in that clinical setting um, to do that because they perhaps don't know the patient as well, or they're not they don't have the time. Actually, they might not have the time they might always feel by dint of the fact they're in a hospital that they must throw treatments at people. Um, yeah. And also, it's I suppose, you're training, you have to be dispassionate, don't you? You can't. I mean, I'd be a terrible doctor. I would just cry and <laughs> over-emote and become so sensitive. I'd be a bloody mess. I mean, there's a degree of, that you need a degree of dispassionate cool, don't you? I think there's, you encounter areas of medicine where there's almost a sense that death is, you know, a failure of medical care when actually mm. death is a sort of inevitable consequence of all sorts of disease processes and accidents. And I think sometimes perhaps we don't think about it in quite the right, <laughs> quite the right way. Um, yeah. But also it's an interesting thing. I think one thing that's quite revealing of our attitudes towards it as a society is, you know, a lot of hospice care in this country is, is charitably funded. And I think that's a, interesting reflection of the fact that perhaps it hasn't always been thought of as being centrally important so the only shared experience other than birth that we all have isn't isn't isn't, isn't deemed worthy of centralized funding is sort of interesting in itself describe at its worst what the covid ward was was like so um we had very, very sick patients um, on CPAP who were, you know, relatively young, sometimes often, in, you know, people in their 40s, 50s, um, who were just unbelievably sick and sort of unstable. And I think we had a lack of knowledge earlier on about how to manage them because we'd never managed it before. So lots of these patients developed blood clots in their lungs um, lots of them benefit from being turned and from being on their fronts in terms of their oxygenation um, a lot of them it's very difficult to feed them because when they don't have this very tight fitting mask on they can't maintain their oxygen levels and so that's another difficult thing um, and then I suppose the question of these patients when actually should they have a breathing tube and go to intensive care is a difficult you know I don't think there's necessarily a right answer, although a lot of evidence is emerging. But early on, I think, you know, it was just not clear what the right thing to do was. And it's very hard to want to do by the, the best by your patients as a team and just not really to have the required information. There's been a lot of collaboration between, you know, hospitals and doctors and intensive care units. And 
I think these things are becoming clearer, but certainly in the first two or three weeks, it was really, you know, that was really frightening, sort of wanting to do your best and not necessarily knowing how. And bearing that you said it was a new, as you say, new disease and no one really knew the best protocols. What was your PPE kit like in the early days? So we've had very good PPE in the hospital I work in. Um, although I have never been sort of fit tested for a mask, which seems to be something that's sort of fallen by the wayside um, in a lot of hospitals. So we had we have sort of full PPE for seeing patients on CPAP, which is an aerosol generating procedure. And then for the other patients, we have the sort of mandated PPE, which I think is um, not necessarily very evidence-based or adequate, but that's what the Public Health England guidance is, which is a plastic apron, which looks like sort of half a bin bag, um, a pair of gloves and a um, surgical mask, which um, there are lots of questions about how effective they are. And I think, you know, it's interesting, we were talking earlier about losing your sense of smell and the fact that that wasn't, you know, clear that that was a symptom of COVID. I think this is no criticism in my hospital, and I think this has been true in all hospitals, you know, there were, it was very difficult to know early on, lots of these patients are asymptomatic, lots of patients who we didn't suspect had COVID have turned out to have COVID. The swabs are not completely reliable. You know, it's very difficult to know where to put people to prevent cross infections, all of these sorts of problems. And so I think the guidance that you wear PPE of some kind to see all patients is when this is a very prevalent problem is really sensible but you know in the early stages that wasn't the guidance you know there is no doubt that healthcare professionals have infected a lot of patients um and you, you know you, you said that your hospital was very um hot on the PPE and had the supplies do you, do you know other doctors in other hospitals who didn't have what they needed in those early days yeah, so I've, I've been working with this um, Doctors Association UK, which is a great organisation. And one of the things they've done is um, they've got this app, which you can, um, they've used to collect data about PPE. It's only from doctor. it's only for doctors at the moment. Um, but the submissions are sort of horrifying. And obviously it's people who want to spend their time, you know, submitting information about PPE, but they can submit PPE um sort of information and then they can request PPE and then we've been working with a couple of um, organisations who use charitable donations to distribute PPE to the places where we know there's gaps and um, there are still huge gaps and there are gaps in you know there are still gaps in intensive care units where for example surgeons are being asked to do tracheostomies you know I was talking to someone the other day who'd been asked to do a tracheostomy which is putting a breathing tube through the front of someone's neck and with a you know patient's gown like a fabric gown with some sleeves taped on and you know there are there are no there is no doubt there are still huge gaps there's huge gaps in care homes there's huge gaps in sort of all sorts of community settings but a lot of the deliveries that they do are actually still to hospitals so your your push at the moment is to essentially get more ppe but to drive it to the community setting um, uh, participants so that, you know, um, drivers, care workers, you know, community nurses can, can have the sort of proper stuff that they need. Yeah. And I obviously am a healthcare worker and care a lot about my colleagues, but it applies to many areas of life, doesn't it? People who work in transport, people Mm -hmm. who, work for the postal service you know there's a lot of people who've been exposed to a lot of risk and obviously I completely understand that it's a pandemic and these things are not available instantly but I don't think we've acted very quickly or very efficiently to um, get PP to where it's needed and I think it's been um, a disappointing effort in some ways. And what do you do with that disappointment? I mean, how do you channel that? As you say you want to help people, you want to save lives and when there's the kit that you have is inadequate well, how does that make you feel? Um, I suppose I've tried not to be angry all the time and to do things um, with my free time that are constructive. So I've sort of spoken a reasonable amount on the radio and things about 
what I see as being the problems to PPE, but also some of the other problems for healthcare staff that I feel strongly about. So the fact there is no commitment yet to how their deaths are going to be investigated, which I think is quite shocking given the amount of rhetoric around healthcare workers being heroes. There's no commitment to opening inquests into all of their deaths to understand the sort of local circumstances. And there's no commitment to a public inquiry looking at um, the availability and the policies around PPE. And I think both those things are needed. I suppose the other things I feel strongly about that relate to healthcare workers are there's so many people from abroad working in health services and care. And there's, you know, loads of them have really sort of uncertain visa situations. And, you know, I feel strongly that we're saying these people are heroes, they're, you know, risking their lives to look after the people of this country. I don't think the visa sort of assurances that have been made are very satisfactory. There's been some assurances about visas for, you know, the dependents of people who die, but what about the people who you know who don't die? I think they're important too. Um, and then about fees for international medical graduates and various other issues. Um, I think you have to sort of understand that there's a certain amount of antipathy, certainly among doctors towards the government, because I think people feel that over the last sort of decade or two, doctors have been hung out to dry a bit. Well, I mean, I think you can say that without it almost being too political a statement. I mean, the economic facts are uh, a matter of public record, are they not? That austerity meant there was less money and there was less money for hospitals, but almost more acutely, and this goes back to your very first point, you're seeing people who had the money been available 10 years ago may not ever have had a hospital outcome because the interventions grassroots would have been there to remove alcohol dependency, get some mental health treatments in place. So uh, I'm interested, I mean, I I sort of read that, you know, NHS trusts are, I mean, one has to be very sceptical about what you read, but NHS trusts are sort of silencing doctors. They're trying to maintain the the sort of wall of, of, um, a, a, a sort of no criticism, I suppose, by by not allowing people, you know, doctors, nurses, etc., to sort of say how it's how it really is. Do you do you have any sense of that? Yeah. So the Doctors Association has done a um, survey about sort of whistleblowing and speaking up around PPE and around COVID, um, which is not quite finished. But um, I think that's in response to the fact that there's many, many reports of there's all sorts of things. So there's the idea that people can't speak about what's happening in their trusts. And, you know, one of the things that made me speak out about this in the first place was that I found it hard to convince my family um, about the sort of dangers and how serious the problem this was. Um, And also I, I, I was going to do an interview and I, um, I was trying to find someone from intensive care to um, be interviewed with me to talk about the fact that many intensive care you know, units were under huge strain and struggling with capacity. And it's really, really hard to find people who are willing to talk um, because there is a culture of it not going very well for people who do. And um, but that's awful. That's that's it is awful. And, you know, there's one of the things that's drawn me to working with the Doctors Association and sort of campaigning, which is not something I've ever done about anything in my life, is that I think there's various sort of problems in the NHS and in healthcare that have real sort of ramifications for patient safety. So um, one of the things you know, that was important in the Francis inquiry and also in the um, case of this breast surgeon who's now been imprisoned um, is that lots and lots of things that go wrong in medicine, it's clear that people have known about for years. So this surgeon Lots and lots of people were quoted saying who worked with him or who knew about him locally saying, I would never have let anyone in my family be treated by him. And how on earth does a situation like that arise? And I think progress is being made, but there's a huge disparity. There's a sort of movement towards speak up guardians and all sorts of things in hospitals. But I think there's a huge disparity between that and the reality. And the reality is what's happened to doctors like Chris Day, who spoke up about the fact that his the intensive care he worked in was not safely staffed. And the consequences for him have been absolutely terrible. And the proof is sort of in the pudding. So you can say you have a commitment to protecting whistleblowers and there's lots of new whistleblower legislation and sort of schemes and things. But the reality is 
people's behaviour is actually influenced by how whistleblowers are treated mm. by the NHS, um, by the healthcare organisations. And the track record is absolutely terrible. And that is obviously concerning for staff and for doctors, but it's concerning more broadly for um, for for patients and for yeah. patient safety. And I think it's concerning really with, I, I'm very interested in whistleblowing and how you encourage people to speak up and how you have sort of systems which encourage that. You know, you look at the inquiries into children who've died and social services that have been sort of high profile in my lifetime. And individuals are always sort of scapegoated and seem to be put forward by the authorities as a sort of lamb to the slaughter to protect the reputation of social services or these organisations. And I think, first of all, that's you know it's terrible for the individuals involved it's completely unfair but the other thing is it's terrible for society because it means that the problems in those organizations are not addressed and they don't become any more effective at things like protecting children and I suppose it's something I'm very interested in campaigning about and one of the things I'm interested in I don't know if you know about the case of this doctor let me just find her name um while you're doing that, I'll rant about whistleblowing because in my own profession, obviously there was there was a, a sexual predator who, um, in the form of Jimmy Savile, who who mm. was allowed, and he was it, it came down to it, he was allowed to predate for decades, and everybody apparently knew. So, yes. what is and, and the the idea that the people that knew who stayed silent thought that was a better line to follow than to protect young and vulnerable people is jaw-dropping. But then I suppose big institutions, and the NHS is one of the biggest, um, feel that they don't want to encourage any more public scrutiny after after a decade or so of, of carrying the can for austerity and stuff. But it's yeah, still an excuse, is it? But these are, our, you know, these are our public services and we should know what happens inside them. And, you know, I think just as an example of how problematic these things are, if people have been able to speak up early on about how bad COVID was, how disastrous it was inside hospitals, how sick people were, how sick the patients they were seeing were, you know, people might have taken it more seriously early on instead of having this, you know, NHS England decided that there was a sort of, it was a, critical you know instant or something and that communications about it would be controlled in a particular way because it was a sort of crisis I'm afraid I don't know what the terminology is but I can find it out for you if you want and um, and that was the sort of policy and one of those things that I was told in my hospital you know is that so that you know you don't scare people well I think people should be sort of treated as adults and allowed to make their own decision and that you know in my life the way I make decisions is by trying to get as much high quality information as possible to base that comes from is the front line with doctors and nurses treating patients how does it make you feel every thursday at eight o'clock I and mean, i presume you are you are uh, busy doing medicine but on the <laughs> rare occasion when you're not what kind of emotions does it stir in you positive and perhaps negative when everyone takes to the streets and bangs their saucepans and 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 gives cheer so i am um... I've only, I've only been at home once because I've been at work the rest of the Thursdays. Um, I mean, I found it incredibly humbling and moving. Um, I suppose I just wish people, you know, you said death is our own sort of universal experience. We all want to live long and happy and healthy lives. And I feel perhaps it throws into focus the fact that maybe we should value health, health care, a bit more highly than we do sometimes yes it, it's I, I bore my, but I still bore my eyes out most, most <laughs> of those days but but for that reason really it's just like why didn't we always do this why didn't we always exist in a, in a even for a moment in a place of gratitude for the system we have and improve upon it day by day yeah, opposed to sort you know, of either taking it for granted or in some cases just sort of berating it or privatising it or whatever, you know, taking chunks out of it. And, you know, doctors are paid, obviously, more than most healthcare workers, but a lot of changes that have been made. I, I love being a doctor. I know lots of people who absolutely love being a nurse. I think they're wonderful jobs. I think it's a great privilege. You know, 
being a nurse, just to decide to train as a nurse or a doctor now, you know, I think many people look at it and think, no thanks, because there's a lot of really undesirable aspects of it. Some of the changes that have been made to sort of nursing bursaries and things mm. you know, it has made it really quite unattractive. And I think that's something that, you know, could be thought about a lot more. And I suppose the thing I'd say to people is, I'm incredibly glad this is what I've done with my life. And, you know, I think they're really, really wonderful jobs. But as you say, you have to... Some people, the kids now growing up and for whom their first memory of maybe doctors and nurses might be seeing their parents clapping outside, you know, will we'll, we'll get involved in the profession because they too want to be, in quotes, heroes. But for those who are a little bit older, you're right, there has to be, it, it's it's almost becoming financially prohibitive, uh, particularly to train to, to be a nurse. Um, I sort of feel with the whole heroes thing, although they, you know, everyone who works in that sector undoubtedly are, it'd be good to just back it up with some solid economic sort of help and to say, if you want to be a hero, we will make sure you don't graduate with X number of thousands of pounds of debt. Yeah, it's very interesting. Do you ever read... Do you ever read the FT? Well, I'm not a stocks and shares girl, <laughs> but maybe I should take to it. I don't know. So I don't know. Some some of the uh, well, some of the coverage of um, coronavirus has been really brilliant in the FT. And anyway, I was just thinking about this columnist who I think is called Janan Ganesh, who wrote an article a while ago about you know, basically being a doctor, having become, having once been a sort of high status, desirable job, and the fact that's been sort of eroded and lost and I I think it's interesting I suppose the you know fortunes of different professions wax and wane but this does feel like a bit of a you know has felt like a bit of a trough in how desirable it is to be a doctor in recent years. But perhaps a, 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 a peak of it will come again and you know these things kind of rise and fall but as you say it's like I suppose everyone has just taken it for granted for so long this is brought very sharply into focus that um not only be lucky to have the NHS, but but actually, we need to pay more attention because I mean, in your in your estimation, presumably, COVID is something that we will have to live with for some time. It's interesting. I think that's true, and I also think if you look at SARS and various other things, you know, there are likely to be other pandemics potentially of infectious diseases, whether you know of respiratory viruses or you know, it's yeah, I think it's here to stay, isn't it? And I guess um, Emily Maitlis did that incredibly charged, powerful introduction, (laughs) you know, because we've said, oh, it affects everybody. But as you pointed out, and she pointed out to different degrees, you know, it's very different for me with a garden and, you know, very much one of the fortunate haves. And it is for somebody perhaps down the road in an abusive relationship in a small space with limited resource to getting out and being free and and I I sort of think if there's anything good that can come out of this horror it's it's really pushing to create change so that that disparity is you know doesn't exist and I I find it very confusing and difficult and I'm not an economist and I'm not anything really but I, I have really used this time to try and get to know people in my vicinity and the charities that work near me because that's the only change I'll ever stand a chance of of affecting really. Yeah and you know Something somebody said to me early on in this that really struck me was, you know, maybe we need to get used to sort of making making do with less. I think it feels as though we've gone sort of, you know, through the looking glass or down the rabbit hole or something and we're in this completely unfamiliar landscape. And then at some point, I hope, you know, we'll emerge blinking into the sun. But the thing we will emerge into will not be the thing we lived in before. And no. I suppose for me, you know, I hope everyone is thinking about what sort of world they do want to live in. But but we have now reached a world, and, and it's the similar world that, that they live in in the States, where, you know, it's, if we're, it's, it's jingoism and populism and it's catchphrases and sloganeering and, you know, get it done and save this, save that, save. I, and a lot of people, I think, want to look beneath that and go, yeah. We have amazing things. We have amazing public services and institutions, and they're really worth saving. Yeah, and one of the mean things... it shouldn't be criticised and looked at, and that fault should be a blame should be apportioned if if it's appropriate and lessons learned. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things I found a bit 
sort of disturbing as a um, theme has been this idea, I suppose, going back to what, what we were talking about earlier about, you know, not wanting to scare people, this thing about behavioral sciences and basically how you manipulate or influence people's behavior. And I'm sure there is some value in that and this thing of whatever it's called, the nudge unit and mm -hmm. um, whatever. But there's also a lot that's disturbing about that. And, you know, one of my sisters as a primary school teacher, you know, my hope would be as a society that what you aim to do people with, is to educate people properly such that they are able to live you know fulfilling lives have you know enjoyable jobs be productive um, and also assess information to make decisions themselves and that what you're, you aim to do that rather than aiming to sort of influence their behavior in all sorts of um, bizarre and sort of clandestine ways and although I think it's a very interesting area of science and psychology and I think it's you know valuable in many ways I think some of the um, things that have emerged are quite disturbing. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think what people want is to be given high quality information and to be able to make decisions for themselves. And that's certainly what I want. I don't want to get to a stage where government is a sort of form of centralised gaslighting. A sort of, <laughs> you know what I mean? A sort of Orwellian uh, sort of super state where you're, you're told that black is white and you go, but it isn't. And they go, but it is. Yeah. And then you hear it so many times that you will no longer perceive colour in your own way, but in a way that is that is told to you and I, I I don't think we're there yet don't get me but but I I I think you're absolutely right I think yes and you I'm know not, these I'm, ludicrous claims like you know about testing numbers where actually it turns out some of the numbers for tests are you know nearly 20,000 tests that have just been sent out in the post and these sort of bizarre calculations and you think wouldn't it be so much better to say to people you know we've managed to expand this exponentially it's brilliant today we did this many we're still getting better you know, and just to be truthful and honest about it and to accept things that, you know, have yeah. gone brilliantly and to, you know, praise the people involved and to be honest about the things that haven't gone so brilliantly and to work out what you're going to do about them. But if you're not honest about them, then it's difficult to um, make much mm. progress, I think, in some senses. And for me, you know, an extraordinary leadership in, in these extraordinary times would be somebody going, we are learning all the time. We are doing our very best for those who have died and to their families, we cannot apologise, unreservedly apologise enough. We will do better. We are doing everything we can. This will never, ever happen again. We will double up. We will double down. We will make sure we get what we need. And I, I, instead, we get uh, take it on the chin, suck it to a mugger. It, we're not children, you know, and, and I don't need to hear about the Second World War. Yeah, and this rhetoric about, you know, being a fighter battling things. Yeah. You know, that's, I don't know, it's, there's a whole, well, all this, you know, there's a whole rhetoric. academic discourse around, you know, how we talk about illness. But I think it's very interesting and I don't think that language is very helpful. Well, I, I, I also think, you know, the moment you frame an illness as vicious as this one in the, in the, in the context of a, of a, of a struggle, then, then, then the people that who, who have died are, you know, they've been vanquished. They're the losers. They're weak. They're, you know, you, and as you've seen, as you said, you know, in your direct experience, you've had young people and this, this disease has taken, however old or young they are, it has taken people before their time. Even if they were 99, a hundred years old, if they died from COVID, they died before they their time. They would they died at a, at a time before they would have done had had this thing not yeah. been around. It's very interesting. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day who I respect a lot, who said, um, "Well, a friend who's an economist um, has told me, you know, actually most of the people who've died in this have, were in the last three to six months of their life, and so if you look at mortality statistics over a year or two years, probably it won't be very different to the last two years." And I said, well, first, I mean, I, I don't know what the statistics are. First of all, that's not my experience because I've looked after many people who've died well before their time. And the other thing is that that's far, you know, that's all well and good. And I said to him, but what if it was two years or three years or five years before they would otherwise have died? How would you feel? I think this person's in his 60s or 70s. How would you feel if, you know, how would you feel if that was you? And he said, well, I wouldn't be so keen on dying, you know, three years before my time and you think you know there's all sorts of different ways of thinking about this aren't there about economics and the mm -hmm. suffering that will be caused by 
you know, GDP shrinking and debt and borrowing and all of these things. And I know there's lots of there's lots of considerations, but you know, I don't want my parents my parents to you know die before their time. And no, you know, nobody I, does. Nobody does. And so I think I it's an you know I think that's a sort of interesting. I think there's hard there's hard sort of economic arguments being made in the middle of a pandemic always sit very uncomfortably. And, you know, it goes back to, to how we started, really, is if if people only want to look at this pandemic and, 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 the, and austerity and everything else, really, that is that is difficult in society through the prism of economics, then I would say this, you know, the people that come and see you who are morbidly obese or who are addicted or who are self-harming, to have spent money on services that would have got to them sooner would save money. If it's just, if you're just looking at it and during that time, they would have been able to have fulfilling jobs, one hopes, to pay their taxes, to contribute in, in myriad ways. So why is it, why does it make any economic sense? Same with mental health. Don't fund mental health. Okay, you've got, you know, say, I don't know the statistics, but swathes of the population taking time off through depression, anxiety. Mm. Just on an economic level, fund these things. And uh, that's why I don't understand <laughs> economists, because it's always after the, the, the horse has bolted. So in this case, after people have died, going, oh, well, it's okay, because they were, they were no longer productive. What does yeah. that mean? <laughs> These are, and as you say, they're, they're lives and worthy of respect and curiosity. And I'm not actually, although, you know, I am party political, I'm not trying to be party political in any of this, because I think any government would be struggling in this situation. But I think it's it's the hallmark of a government, how they communicate that to the public and, and what responsibility they take along the way. Yeah, I think that's true. And um, I think having the being big enough to accept that mistakes have been made is, or that you've made mistakes, is really important in all of life, isn't it? If you were suddenly made the Director of Public Health England <laughs> or Prime Minister, um, what simple things would you put in place for today, but also for the future to make healthcare provision better for everybody? Goodness me. Um, I like to end on just something small scale. I feel like you should, like, have, you should, have, you should have warned me about that. Um, I suppose in general terms, for healthcare and social work, um, it's not something I've thought about a huge amount, but I think there's a massive, massive focus. You know, look at the press coverage of coronavirus. There's a massive focus on acute care and you know intensive care and hospitals basically you know most people are not in hospital um, most medical care is done by gps and most care should be done locally and i know it's not very glamorous to say you should invest in community services and you know people love the idea of cpr and you know whatever but actually the way you know the way to make people live sort of healthier lives i think is to put much more money into um general practice make and, and integrating all of these things so district nursing mental health services there's so much sort of fragmentation there's so many different people involved often who you know the communication between them is not very good um between drug and alcohol services you know all these things actually i think we should be looking at having really really strong well integrated community services and far fewer people should be in hospital and you know hospitals are really expensive and as somebody who works in hospital and loves working in hospital you know I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy being a patient in hospital you know it's absolutely hideous um you you know you only want to be in hospital if it's absolutely necessary and unfortunately in the good times we have lots of people in hospital who would be better off elsewhere and there because there's you know all sorts of problems with other things um, so I suppose that's what I would say. And, you know, other countries seem to be, there's some very interesting organisations in Holland um, that have developed really, really strong, very local networks of, you know, multidisciplinary healthcare teams. And I suppose that's something I'm very interested in. I'm incredibly proud to work at North London Hospice, which is a inpatient hospice, but which runs the community teams around it. 
and is a really good example of something that's kind of well integrated and really well run. And, you know, I, I personally think you want you want to keep people out of hospital as much as possible and look after them well in their homes. And I think that's what most, you know, that's how most people want to be looked after. And are things frontline? Do you have available beds at the moment? Do you have, as, as Matt Hancock's favourite word, capacity? Well, that's such <laughs> that's such a sort of um, misguided, not question, but yes, I mean, there's capacity if you want to go to hospital with coronavirus. Um, if you want to go to hospital to have your cancer treated or diagnosed, you know, that's really problematic at the moment. Mm. You know, huge parts of hospitals are not running and we need to get them back up and running. Um, you know, it depends, depends, depends what you're looking for, doesn't it? Yeah, no, but um, that's exactly that. That one, that one word, capacity. You're right. Has has st- started to exclusively mean if you are a COVID patient. Yeah, it's quite a meaning. It's quite a sort of meaningless um, word, isn't it? And the other thing is that it's really, you know, hospital beds is a very odd measure. So I think some of the talk about intensive care capacity has been really weird because I know people working in intensive cares where there's two patients per bed space with, you know. 50 centimetres between them, possibly 60 centimetres between them. And there's one well-trained intensive care nurse per six. And yes, there's lots of staff, but they're not, they're not trained, you know, they're not intensive care trained staff, although I'm sure they're now better trained than they were. And, you know, this is not intensive care as we know it. We haven't expanded intensive care like if you went to an intensive care last year. And so I think some of the talk about it is quite misleading. You know, I know Nightingale hasn't Fortunately, the capacity hasn't been needed, but the staffing models there were radically, radically different to how an intensive care would normally be staffed. People who work in intensive care are incredibly highly trained. You can't obviously magic loads of very highly trained people. You can't double the number of very highly trained people overnight because training takes years. And um, I think, look, heroic things have been done. There's been, you know, massive massive change in a very short period of time and we should credit that but I think we should also be honest about what we've actually achieved which is not you know an expansion in intensive care as we know it. So when's your next shift? When are you on next? Um, I am working on Thursday. Okay so what what do you do in your free time? What's between now and Thursday? Are you actually going to relax? Are you going to eat? Are you going to sleep? Are you going to just take care of yourself? No, I'm probably not going to relax because, as you know, I'm organising this auction, um, which you've very kindly agreed to host. No, so tell us probably, about that's probably that, what I'll be doing. Go on. Um, so I wrote, I feel very fortunate about this. I wrote two, I wanted to raise some money for these organisations that we've been working with at the Doctors' Association who are really amazing. So one of them is called Scrub and Facial Protection Hub, and they've um, done a lot. Sort of network Scrub of, Hub. Yeah. Um, they've done a lot of work so with 3D printing of visors and people sewing scrubs and they're doing a brilliant job and the other one is NHS Hero Support which is sort of slightly bigger and what they've done is they've worked a lot in medical sort of logistics it's a bunch of volunteers and they've been managing to get hold of PP from China and getting it to places where there's gaps um, and then the other thing is they're involved um, with various other projects to try to develop um washable gowns for example that could be used sort of multiple times and sort of some of the solutions to some of the problems which ideally wouldn't be endlessly throwing away you know huge volumes of stuff um so I wanted to raise some money for them and I wrote <laughs> I wrote to um I wrote to two people I wrote to Giles Corrin and I wrote to Sue's um agent whose email address I found on I the love internet. the fact that you wrote directly to Giles but that you <laughs> I managed, to get hold of, I managed to get hold of his email address. Through the gates of Cerberus. Unfortunately, I never really watch TV and I don't really know who anybody famous is. And um, that is somebody I did, did know who he was, probably because I'm obsessed with going to restaurants. And um, I wrote These were the two people you'd heard of. I have heard of other people, but <laughs> two people who I knew were funny. Um, and so I wrote to um, these two people and Giles Corrin said he, um, he said that he wasn't famous enough to host it. Um, so... Sue's agent fortunately replied and Sue I love the fact we're talking about me as if I'm not here now. Sue's agent. (laughs) I'm going to start referring to myself in the third person so I'm that grandiose. Sorry. So Sue very kindly agreed um, and so we're hosting an auction and launching a campaign called 
asks for masks, which was Sue's um, idea. Well, it's a sort of loose pun. I think people will know. It has that sort of terrible homespun shitness that people will automatically associate with me. Um, <laughs> so we are going to be hitting eBay when, remind me. You know I have no capacity for that word again to remember anything. So I, I thought this was going to be a thing which would take me a you know, few hours to organise, um, which just shows how completely clueless I was. So a huge number of incredibly um, talented people have been making a website um, and all sorts of other things. And it's going to launch... Um, so the first auction is going to launch on Thursday after Clap for Carers and Sue is going to do a live streamed event which closes yes. it on so this the is Thursday, Thursday. This is Thursday the 14th of May. Yeah, and then there's all sorts of people who've donated all sorts of brilliant things. Um, so you can have a look on the website if you like and see if there's anything you fancy. And do you have that? I don't even have the URL for the website. I don't even know if URL is the right word either. All right, right. I'm not the person to ask. So the... Um, the website when it what launches absolute which absolute shit shower we are we well, either be, it will good either be today or tomorrow it's going to be www.asksformasks.co.uk all right www.asksformasks.co.uk and there'll be prizes some some sort of big sort of hefty prizes and experiences that, that um, you can bid towards and then some uh, items that you can just buy outright that won't break the bank and all that money will go to basically acquiring PP and getting it to the community settings where it's needed most. Yeah, the hospitals. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you to Sue, but to <laughs> all the other many, many people who've devoted countless hours to it. Well, I guess um, my agent, Debbie, who is monstrous, and I mean that in a loving way, but also <laughs> still very frightened of her way after 10 years. Um, if you, uh, She's normally just, she's a workaholic, but, but in lockdown, she suddenly has this window of time and she's, she's grabbed this with, with, a, with a sort of glee that is very, very impressive. And I'm just... Very glad. And Giles didn't tell me that he'd put me up for an auction. So basically, you said, can you give a prize? Giles said, yeah, I'll have dinner with Sue. Didn't even tell me. So I've now upped the prize. Uh, and I'm not going to tell Giles the added thing, which is that we're both going to have to come in full period costume to a restaurant of your choice, get you drunk. And then Giles is going to write a review of you in the entire evening. So that's just one of the lots. But um, I will bore people about it on my Twitter video. Thank you for your time. Thank you for getting me involved in this. It's uh, Thank you. No, thank you. You know, I'm just a sort of podgy cretin who's been waiting for something to get stuck into during lockdown. So I'm glad to be of any help that I can. And thanks for sharing your time and your experiences and stuff. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. When the pillars have been restored and the churches there are no more. That was Dr. Katie Sanderson taking a moment out to talk to me from her rather hectic schedule, as you can imagine. Uh, the Ask for Mask website is www.asksformasks.co.uk. The auction is open now. Check out the live event on the 14th of May at 8.15 after the clap for carers. And you follow us on the Asks for Masks YouTube channel while I'll be hawking stuff in order to get PPE out to those in the front line who need it most. Uh, the author that she referenced, if you want to look her up, is um, Hadiza Hawa Garba. And season two of the podcast is going to return with some more episodes next month. I can't wait to be in your ears. Take care. The scream all runs warm, and the music don't play no more. When they run out of lemons to grow, I'll be there if you want me to. When the priests don't believe in a man. And the Taurus have started to tend.